Good morning and welcome to Together in God, a media ministry of Grace Lutheran Church of the ELCA at 202 West Grand Avenue in Eau Claire. We are excited to share with you today God's message of love and hope for all. Please join us now in worship. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. So good to, to see you here and to gather on this Sunday morning. We have a warming house we always do with the holiday parade. So the holiday parade starts in the parking lot here and goes right by our facility because it's often a cold <laughs> night. We have cho hot chocolate and cookies and things that the city provides and the scouts help us uh, to distribute. That's on December 6th. And if you want to help in handing out those cookies and things, that would be lovely. Just talk to me. Uh, this is the week of Roger Shepler's birthday. 90 years old, right? We're going to sing him happy birthday at the end of the service. Don't let me forget. So, yeah, let's give Roger an applause. Let us begin our worship. If Rise in either body or spirit, and we'll begin with our confession and forgiveness. We gather today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Can I tell you a scary story? Do you guys like scary stories? It's more scary for parents than it is for kids, but it's still a scary story. So I used to live in Texas. That's not the scary part really yet. Uh, and when we first moved there, my wife, Laura, Pastor Lori, would take our son, Lucas, who was three years old, and our daughter, who was Louisa, who was five years old, on field trips once a week. And one time, they went on a field trip downtown, and they went to the tallest building in, in Austin, Texas. And Luke was in front of them, and they were here, and the elevator doors opened, and Luke saw them open. He was three years old. He ran over into the doors, and he went inside, and the doors closed and uh, uh, they panicked and 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 they hit the button um, and the, it went way up and then it came way down and then it opened up and Luke wasn't in the elevator <laughs> oh so they jumped on the elevator and they hit the the basement button and it, it went down and the doors opened, and the caterer downstairs was holding Lucas in his arms and says, this happens all the time, ma'am. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And on the bus ride home, Luke turned to his 
mom, or Luke, Louisa turned to her mom and said about Luke, it'd be real sad if we were going back on the bus without Lucas. <laughs> she said, yeah, we would not be doing that. But we learned at that time that when you go someplace where there's a lots of things happening, it's good to pick one place where you're going to meet if everybody gets, anybody gets separated. Right? So we'd say, all right, we're going to the mall. If anybody gets separated, meet at the Dairy Queen or something like that. During these couple of months, I'm going to be talking to you a lot about communion. And uh, you can see it set up on the altar there, right? You've seen these things before, but I just keep showing you so that when you see them later on, you'll know what they are. This is the bread. Yep, you've seen that. Yes. And these are glasses of wine. You usually pick the white ones if you're going to have communion. But Luke always picked the red ones because that's just the kind of little boy he was. <laughs> Jesus says there are times in your life you're going to feel lost. So I'm going to give you some places we can meet. And one of the places he promises to meet us is when we share this meal. So when we eat the bread and we drink the cup, he says, I promise I'll be with you there. That doesn't mean that God can't meet us in other places. God could meet you out there. God could meet you in the Walmart. God could meet you at home. But this is one of the places God says, no matter what, I'll meet you there. If we got lost at the mall and I went and stood by, where would I stand by the mall? Ragstock. And said, where are they? We all agreed on a place. But if the place was Dairy Queen and I'm over at Ragstock, are we going to find each other? Nope. Nope. Because we're in the wrong places. We're not in the places we agreed upon. So Jesus says, whenever you share this meal, I will be there among you. There's other ways God says, I will be present with you. He says, when you're baptized, that's a place I promise I'll show up. When you think about God's word which is what you'll be doing in a little bit in Sunday school, some of you at least, right? You'll be thinking about God's word, and we'll be doing it in this room. Jesus says, I'll show up when you think about my word. He said, uh, when someone hurts another person and they say, I forgive you, I'll show up there. When you're doing your best to offer forgiveness, I will be present in that moment. And when somebody is sad and you bring them comfort, you just say the words that they need to hear. Maybe it's, I love you. Maybe it's just giving them a quiet hug. That's officially called the mutual consolation of the faithful. When we do that for each other, and you can do that for each other, Jesus says, okay, when you do that, I will show up. So it's good, because sometimes we feel lost in life. It's good to know that there are some specific places where we can meet Jesus. Doesn't mean we won't meet him in other places, but we know we can trust when we go to these places, Jesus will be there for us. So that's one of the reasons we celebrate this every week at this church, because we know it's that important to know for sure we'll get a chance to meet Jesus. Let's say a prayer together. Holy and gracious God, we pray that you be with us, that you, as, the, uh, as uh, Jody and Emily lead the Sunday school class, that the kids there meet Jesus in what they teach, and that you help us to be the ones that bring comfort to each other and offer forgiveness when that's what we need. We thank you that you've given us baptism and communion as two places where we can go and trust that you will be with us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading is from Psalm 16. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me, because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your holy ones see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be God. Second reading is from Hebrews chapter 10. Every priest stands, be, 
stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would not would make a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has preferred for all time, protected for all time, those who are sanctified. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he has promised his faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Word of God, word of life.
little background before we start. Uh, the gospel we're reading, like the song we just heard, is an end times kind of uh, passage. And it speaks about the temple. So I put on the cover of the bulletin uh, the temple, if you want to look at that. The one on the top is what the temple looked like in the time of Jesus. Right? For perspective, it is the size of four Lambeau stadiums. I'll put it in your own sacred terms, some of you at least. <laughs> right? not, not Lambeau Field, Lambeau Stadium. Right? So it's a significant size building. The picture below is what's left of it. And you can see that the, that little corner of the red that's circled there is all that's left of it now. And it's circled a little low on the wall because the part above the red circle on that bottom picture is, was rebuilding of the temple, you know, a thousand years later, trying to get it back more like what it was. All right? So when the disciples talk about the buildings they're walking out of, these are, this is the complex they're in. How, how many of you have been to Jerusalem and seen the temple? A couple of you only. Well, when things settle down, we should maybe all head there together. All of us head there together, right? So uh, the gospel, I'll go up here so you can see me. You can follow in the bulletin if you really need to, but you don't have to. As they were coming out of the temple, Jesus and his disciples... One of them said, what stones, what buildings? And Jesus said to them, do you see these great buildings? Not a stone will be left upon a stone that won't be thrown down. Now when they were sitting opposite on, on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him about this, saying, when will this be? What will the sign be that this is about to take place? And he said to them, look out that no one lead you astray. Many will come in my name and lead many astray. When you hear of wars or battles and rumors of battles, don't panic. This is not yet the end. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in many places. There will be famine. But these, they're the beginning of the birth pangs. The gospel of our Lord. The, the stones that they describe are huge. Some of them are the size of like closets here at Grace. They're, they're big stones. How they got them up on the Temple Mount is a mystery uh, buried in history. Sometimes really hard things happen to people. And in this gospel, Jesus predicts probably the hardest thing to happen to Israel in its history. In uh, about a generation after Jesus' death and resurrection, so about 40, 50 years late after, somebody from Jesus' hometown led a rebellion against Rome because they were tired of having a foreign power controlling everything that went on in their country. And so this man led a rebellion, an armed rebellion, and Rome responded with all the force of Rome and just crushed them into nothing. Uh, a historian of the time, Josephus, says one million people died in these battles. Uh, some of them on, uh, on the ground, and others uh, who wanted to be, they want, Rome wanted to make an example of, they crucified them. So there were uh, hundreds, thousands of crosses with people crucified on him. I have a friend who knows about these things, and he said, the biggest problem Rome had at that time was finding enough trees for all the wood they wanted. Right? People, another 100,000 people were taken as slaves, and the rest of the people scattered because it was a frightening situation. What do you do 
when something so catastrophic happens? Right? Well, the first thing they did was they grieved, and they grieved, and they grieved. And actually, they continued grieving, not for 60 or 70 years, for 60 or 70 generations. Right? When you were there in the Holy Land, no doubt you saw people lined up at, at this fragment of the wall. It's called the West Wall or the Wailing Wall. And people gather there and they wail their prayers to God. And the things they passionately desire, they write on little scraps of paper and they stick in the cracks of the bricks. The people of God grieved for 60 generations. 60 generations, imagine that. Right? 2,000 years. Why did they grieve so long? It was because of all that they lost. Not only the land they live in, lived in, not only some of their neighbors who were killed in that death, not only their families, some of whom, men, women, and children, perhaps they saw crucified before their eyes, but also the temple. The, the temple in Jerusalem was the heart of everything in Israel. It was obviously the religious center where sacrifices were offered on a regular basis for the people. It was the place people gathered in festivals. Every good Jew tried to make it at least once in their life to Jerusalem. It was also the political and civic and social and economic center. I don't know what you could add that wouldn't be true in terms of how it centered Israel's life. And it was, the temple was, the household of God. It was the place where Israel believed God's presence was deepest, densest. As I said to the children, it's the place you could go and count on God showing up for you. So what happens when the most powerful nation in the world comes in and knocks down God's house, not to be restored for generations and generations? What do the people do? Well, they remember. They remember this is not the first time the people of God have found themselves in such a situation. They remembered 600 years earlier, another powerful nation, Babylon, came in and destroyed the temple that existed at that time and dragged their leadership away into exile. And they remembered that God said, you're going into exile, well, so am I then. And God went with them into exile. They remembered Jesus speaking the words we listen to today, that Jesus saw that this destruction of the temple was coming and warned them about it. This whole uh, chapter of 13 is like one very long, soon and very soon song. Right? It speaks of natural disasters, famine, flooding, disease, speaks of battles between one people and another. It speaks, Jesus speaks of, of families divided, brother against brother, children against parents, parents against their children. He speaks of oppression, the like of which hasn't been seen since the beginning of the creation that God created. He says, it will be so dark, so dark, so dark, that it will feel like the sun has ceased to shine and the moon no longer gives its light. It will feel like heaven and earth itself, themselves are falling apart. But my word, he promises, will not depart. My word will not collapse. Jesus gave these disciples these words, which I'm sure they first grabbed onto, thinking, well, this is the worst we'll ever know when they watched his own crucifixion, and we're told in the story, at least, that the sun was darkened for three hours. They thought of how, in Jesus' death, it felt like heaven and earth was coming apart. Everything they had dedicated their lives to for many years was vanishing before them. But they also remembered the last line 
that I shared with you. These are the beginning of the birth pangs. The, the, the contraction you're feeling now, that intense pain, means that a birth will be coming. It's as if Jesus uh, knew the words that, uh, or maybe she knew his words by Valerie Kaur. Uh, her, one of her books is in the back. The, our book club read it. She says, in, in a time that she felt was utterly dark, she said, I feel the dark. Do you feel the dark? She said, but maybe the darkness is not the darkness of a tomb, but the darkness of the womb. Maybe new birth is coming in a way we cannot yet see, still enveloped in what is to come. So what do we do in a time of new birth? The midwife holds the mother's back and she tells her, first breathe, then push. Catch your breath, then push. Push against the darkness. In Spanish, uh, to give birth means to give light to the child. Push for light. She imagines, uh, Valerie Coeur, all the mothers, generation after generation after generation of her faith, who, who held fast to the faith in times of, of struggle and disease and death and persecution. She says, they're standing behind us whispering, you are brave. We can do this with God's help. And so what do we do when a child is born? We, make, we kind of collapse our world into the life of the child, the one who's most vulnerable in our midst, and we attend them, attend to their needs. We feed them. Well, we don't. Half of us <laughs> feed them and care for them giving them strength. The other ones, when, when the one on the front lines is tired, let her go sleep so we can offer some rest for the day ahead. We begin to whisper our hopes and dreams into the ears of the child. We tell them that they are beloved. They are beloved. They are loved. They will be looked after. We lean into our care and we deal with the crap that comes one diaper at a time. Right? We don't dream about the whole future this child will have unfold in front of them. We attend to the days we are in with them. And so, when we find ourselves in difficult times, where, where there's pain coming at us from whatever direction, personal, social, global. We breathe, and then we push. And we do what we need to do for the day we find ourselves in. We, uh, in the lovely verse that Ro uh, Roger read, we provoke each other to love and to good deeds. And we do the small things that are possible, knowing that it'll be the small things that will get us through until the birth happens. May God give us wisdom and hope to be faithful people in this very time we're in. Amen. <laughs>
The source of our soul's wellness is in God, and so we confess together our trust in God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. O God, through Jesus Christ, you have saved us a seat at your right hand. Unite all believers in the covenant you have made with us as we strive for your justice and peace in all the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. By your mercy, you sustain all creation. Be with those suffering with flood, famine, and earthquakes. Strengthen organizations like Lutheran World Relief that come to their aid. Merciful God, receive receive our prayer. With a selfless power, you protect all who take refuge in you. As nations rise up against nations, defend all who are displaced or trampled by their fighting. Empower all people and nations to pursue peace. Merciful God, receive receive our prayer. In your presence, you give fullness of joy. Care for all whom despair and feel that joy is far from them. Be present with persons experiencing depression, anxiety, addiction, any mental illness. Bring them healing and wholeness. Merciful God, receive receive our our prayer. prayer. Through the years, you have gathered your church and this community for worship, fellowship, formation, and service. Enable us to move beyond the walls of our building to go where you are calling us to be. Merciful God, receive our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember loved ones who now delight in your everlasting presence as their lives inspire ours Provoke us always to love and good works. Holding fast to the confession of your hope in you, merciful God, receive receive our prayer. We offer our prayers to you, gracious God, trusting in your boundless love for all that you have made through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Share with a few other people the peace of God.
We pray the prayer Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We sing first, happy birthday to Roger.
Go in peace. Encourage one another in Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being part of our Together in God worship service. Your prayers and financial support are always deeply appreciated. Please tune in again next Sunday at the same time or join us in person at 10 a.m. in the church. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.